Everybody knows that the Broadway producer provides financing for a show. But more importantly, he or she can provide crucial creative and moral support to an artistic team in the hothouse atmosphere of bringing that show to fruition. I'm Patrick Pacheco of New York One and the LA Times for the American Theatre Wing. And I'm delighted to be discussing the creative angle of producing with Daryl Roth and Jean Dumanian, who know quite a lot about it. Daryl has on her mantle six Pulitzers and four Tony Awards for her numerous productions, most recently for The Normal Heart. And Jean has won two Tony Awards, one Pulitzer for August Osage County and an Olivier for The Mountaintop. And a Tony for that minor struggling, also ran of a show, The Book of Mormon. Welcome to you both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I suppose that a show often rises or sinks when somebody says, wouldn't it be a good idea to do a musical version of Pygmalion or Stephen King's Carrie? Uh, one of your colleagues uh, had the flu and saw a movie of Hairspray, Margot Lyon. Mm -hmm. Have either of you in your long and illustrious careers had that eureka moment when you've looked at something and said, aha, yep, that one has po possibilities. Daryl? I actually have. Um, some years ago, I was on the board of the Sundance Institute, and I was out in Utah watching this wonderful array of new films, and I saw a film, a British film, called Kinky Boots. Huh? And I, I just, I couldn't even continue to enjoy it because I wanted to get out of there and call up immediately and say, are these rights available because this has musical DNA written all over it? Uh, which is what I did, and there was very bad cell phone service in Utah in those days. And I, I saw as the credits rolled that it was um, made by Miramax and Disney. And so I called uh, Tom Schumacher, who I know, and inquired about the rights. It took some time, but I did get the rights, and I am actually currently developing a musical based on the film Kinky Boots. So that was my aha moment. <laughs> Usually for me, I will read a script and either get very excited and, and you know, enthusiastic about it or not. But I never had that moment where I saw something in another uh, genre and feel like I had to have it in my, in my theater life. And we should probably add that Cindy Lauper is writing the music <coughs> and Harvey Firestein is writing the book. Is that correct? That's correct. And Jerry Mitchell will be directing it. We'll get to those creative choices okay. in a, in a, a little <laughs> later, but I wanted to ask Jean if there was ever an aha moment for you. Well, mine has worked the opposite way. I have seen and been involved in a play that I thought would be terrific as a film. And August Osage County is absolutely on the boards to become a film. And uh, Harvey Weinstein is going to be the company, and my company, <coughs> excuse me, is going to produce it. So that's very exciting because that's been a play. It's won a Pulitzer and a Tony, and uh, now we're going to make it into a film. So that's uh, a full, it's come full circle, so to speak. It sounds terrific. You obviously both in your offices get tons of pitches, volumes of it. How many, how many <coughs> pitches do you get, say, on a monthly basis? How many scripts do you get? How many books do you get? How many calls <coughs> from <coughs> agents or playwrights? And then we'll talk about how you sort of filter your way through those mm -hmm. pitches. Um, well, I do get a lot of uh, plays sent to me as plays to read. Um, I don't get too many pitches as such. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get calls from agents who will say, you know, could I just send you this play so that you become familiar with this writer's work, you know, which is sort of code for, I hope you love this very play, but if you don't, <laughs> there are more. Um, and I love to work with people that I've worked with before. So if I've mm -hmm. produced someone's work before and they call me, that goes to the top of the list because for me it's all about relationships and kind of being loyal to playwrights that you've worked with before. Such as Charles Bush? Charles Bush is a good example. Nilo <laughs> Cruz is a good example. Edward Albee is the best example. I think, though, that um, what's most interesting to me, and lately I love that this is happening, actors will come to me and say, um, I read this play, and would you read it and just see if you think it's something that you'd want to develop, because I'd like to work with you again. So it comes playwrights, actors, um, agents, certainly, good agents. And people know, I think at this point, probably true of Jean too, the kind of work that we would be attracted to. 
Um, I don't think there's a play about dysfunctional families that doesn't come to both of us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my case, I've been called Queen Esther. I get a lot of Jewish themed plays. <laughs> and I am certainly, um, as many people have called me, the godmother of fairies because I love plays about gender. <laughs> so people now know what to send us. I think, you know, I mean, there are certain plays that wouldn't appeal to me, and I think. Jean, what is your criteria when you're looking through material that has been submitted to you, and how does your background inform that? You're from Chicago. I think you were born of Greek right. immigrant restaurateurs in Chicago. Right. How does your sort of value system that you grew up with inform the choices that you make of what you want to produce? Well, I think that, uh, I think that is innate, and you really don't know if it's influencing, influencing you or not. But uh, I usually go with my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have people in my office who read, and we're sent a lot of scripts from uh, the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, m The Mountaintop had a long journey. It started here at The Lark. We read it. It was actually being performed in London on the top of a uh, pub in a 60-seat theater. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sonia Friedman, Mm -hmm. and I who'd want to work together, mm -hmm. uh, I called her and she went to see it, and she loved it, and we brought it to the Trafalgar, where it won the Olivier, and now it's at uh, the Jacobs. When did you first hear about it? You said it started at the Lark. Did you see it at the Lark? No, uh, the script was sent to me. You read it? It was sent it. to my office. Uh, I read it. I thought it was wonderful. We found out that it was being played, produced, at the... Uh, Theater 503, which uh -huh. is a very small theater. It's a 60-seat theater above a pub. And uh, we brought it to the West End. And then we brought it to New York. And what rang your bell about it? Was it that it was about Martin Luther King? Was it the the The, the, the writing was so good. Katori Hall is such a wonderful writer. And it had a, uh, it had a theme that let you know that Martin Luther King was a, a human being that was not born a leader, but he became one. So it let you know that within you, there may be greatness, and that could be any one of us. And I thought that was really wonderful and inspiring. And did you think, oh, this would be a good vehicle for two stars? Maybe Angela Bassett, Samuel Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I knew this. Because of the climate on Broadway, you have to have a star. I mean, I think August Osage County was one of the last plays mm -hmm. on, uh, don't you agree? Well, that was the most extraordinary ensemble, and I think that that can often work. But it's, as Jean said, it's very tricky economically now to try to do a straight play on Broadway without someone who has name recognition to sell tickets. I'm not so happy about this, mm -hmm. but I've had to buy into it because, you know, it's, it's very competitive. And, um, and it's not to say that a great star isn't the right actor for the part. Right. That can often be the perfect match. It's just sad, in a way, that we have to think about it in well, that way and I, not I, just get great actors. Mm -hmm. I think it's the economy, <clears throat> and I think it's the audience who now are used to seeing stars. And because of the price of the ticket, they want to see a star. Mm -hmm. You know, even though the, the play may be as wonderful as you might want to see, but if there's not a star in it, they're not uh, triggered to buy a ticket. How much are you worried that the work might be compromised by what Daryl brought up? Just the fact that maybe the star isn't the best. Oh, well, to... well, as producers, you have to get the best star for the property. Otherwise, you're defeating your own purpose. Right, so if Kelsey Grammer wants to play Macbeth and people really <laughs> want to see him in something else, you're sort of defeating your purpose in that regard. But I don't think even one of us would cast anybody who was not appropriate for the task. I would sooner sacrifice... The play, not the play, but No, the I would sacrifice the casting concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, in The Normal Heart, for example, that was another, I think, good example of an ensemble of wonderful actors all at the top of their form. And... Um, Sometimes when you think about a play like that, and August I think fits into that, you really skew things in a way that's not helping the play and not serving the playwright. Mm -hmm. So I have a very conflicted idea about the star business. However, there are often stars that are so perfect for the part that it behooves you 
And Samuel Jackson's well, doing a terrific job. Well, he is, I don't know and if you've seen it yet. I have seen it. Yeah. Well, he sure. is wonderful in the part, and uh, Angela uh, Bassett is phenomenal as well. Are you concerned when you see scripts how many people are in the show? Uh, I mean, obviously, this was a two hander, The Mountaintop. That was a no brainer. There's a lot of people yeah. in Normal Heart. Yes. Uh, so, are you. Do you kind of do a count uh, as you're reading well, productions? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, no. the count comes into play more when you're doing off-Broadway, which I also love to produce uh -huh. plays off-Broadway. And then you have to be realistic about what the budget can hold and what you can expect to recoup. Um, but I'm working on a new play, an adaptation of John Grisham's book, A Time to Kill, and that has a very large cast. It yeah. is a play. It will be cast as an ensemble with perhaps one or two names. and. Well, it can't Broadway? be. It will be on Broadway, and I hope it will be next season. I mean, next fall, I believe. But I, I would not sacrifice the play mm -hmm. uh, for the wrong actor. Oh no, I don't think you it, know what I'm no. saying. It can either be strong as an ensemble, and plus, I feel in this case, in this case, John Grisham is sort of the name. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You know, so you have to play all the elements to, you know, the strengths that you have, and um, and first and foremost, you know, consider. How beautifully you can present the play. Do you? Did either of you have mentors in producing? People that you admired, that you looked up to, whose taste you admired, that you sort of wanted to fo uh, to follow in terms of their footsteps. I mean, obviously there were the legendary producers like David Merrick. I was going to say, <laughs> Mr. Whitehead. You mean? Uh, you mean? Uh, at this in this present day, uh, yes. Either in the present day, uh, obviously. I admired Daryl, <laughs> and I admired. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, in but, my case, I really did not have a mentor. Um, you just in truth, in truth, I, I didn't, didn't. I didn't either. You it's, just sort of you know, jumped into it. I jumped into it, and it makes it um, important for me now to mentor young women and men, I should mm -hmm. say, because I didn't have that. And in fact, I had a lot of skepticism when I came into this business. Uh, directed towards me, and um, as a woman, or no, just as a new person on the block. As a new person on the block. Yeah, I don't think it had anything to do with gender. Um, I think women are wonderful producers because there's a huge nurturing aspect to producing, and I think we do that well. However, I didn't feel welcomed into the community. It took me some time to find my footing and my confidence, and I want to help other people that are coming into the business uh, not have to feel that if they're. If they're, you know, good and dedicated and tenacious. Did you feel the same way, Jean, uh, coming into the theatrical community? Well, you know, I started in television yeah, sure. and film. Sure. And and uh, it's kind of a good transition, because films are being made into plays and plays are being made into films. So I was quite comfortable coming into it. Uh, of course, it, it's you, you start and you're a little bit anxious, but. Uh, People are very, very forthcoming in the community. I feel they're very friendly, and you know, if you have a project, you can call up various producers and say, "Do you want to partner with me? Can I send you the script?" So it's a community. But you know, you were talking about uh, large ensembles. Mm -hmm. Well, off Broadway, just two years ago, almost two years mm, ago, we did Our Town. Oh yeah, a great and, production. Mm -hmm. And that had 23 <laughs> in the in the cast. And no stars. And no stars. But a as uh, Daryl said, the star was, of course, George. Thornton Wilder. And David Cromer as well. And, oh, David Cromer. Interpretation. I'm doing another play with David this coming season. Which one is that? Uh, it, it's called Tribes. Uh -huh. And we're going to do it off Broadway. And we're casting now. And we're not uh, off Broadway. It's interesting. But off Broadway, you are not um, forced to get a star. Mm -hmm. to have people come. Off-Broadway, it's usually the project itself that you take a chance with because the economics are so much better off-Broadway. Mm. And uh, I mean, it, I, don't, I think you have had good experience off-Broadway. I produce and a lot off-Broadway. I'm very comfortable doing it and right. I and, and your, love it. And your investors do, I mean, in our case so far, they have recouped their money. And made mm -hmm. just a tiny bit more, so they're happy to be involved in, you know, the kinds of things and interesting things that you can do off Broadway for uh, less of a budget and uh, more freedom. And then there's also always the possibility of a transfer. Uh, yes, exactly. Which, which we'll, we'll get to. But I wanted to first ask you if either of you two had any nostalgia ever for the days when it, when it was one name above the title, the David Merrick, Harold Prince presents sorts of days. 
you now obviously collaborate with 15, 16, 20, 30 producers. But, but it's different because, um, for instance, if, if I find a property mm -hmm. and uh, I, I discover it, I could call Daryl and say, Daryl, I found this property. Do you want to be a partner? So we would be the general partners and we would engage co-producers to help us raise the money. Uh -huh. But we would be kind of the spearheads of a particular play. How do you choose those that you want to invite to the dance? Because obviously there are any number of people out there. Who do you choose who you want to collaborate with, who you're going to be involved with in making all these creative decisions over the next mm -hmm. two-year period, three-year period? How do you choose that? On what basis? Um, well, I think we all have uh, people that we're comfortable with, people that have a, s a shared vision. I like to work with people that I know are going to work hard and roll up their sleeves. Um, I'm less excited about working with people that just want to write a check and get their name and run up and hopefully win a Tony than I am in working with people that will actually, you know, help the marketing concepts, help, help get the word out. You know, I mean, I walk around New York with my dogs and I put flyers in everybody's door. I mean, I'll do anything. I like people in concept Sandwich that will work board, hard girl. with me. Sandwich board on Broadway. I've been known to. Um, but I want to go back to your question about, you know, single producer's name uh -huh. versus many, many. Um, Off-Broadway, you can do it alone. I'm, I'm having the joyous opportunity to do Love, Loss, and What I Wore. It's in its third year now, and I am the only producer. And when I started that, I thought to myself, you know, I can do this, and I want to do it a certain way. I wanted to do a rotating cast every five weeks and keep it interesting and keep it lively. And a lot of people thought that was really a crazy idea. And I said, it may be, and you may, you know, prove to be right about this. And so I'm just going to ignore you and do what I want to <laughs> do, <laughs> which I did, and I love it because it's a team that I put together, you know, that are working with me to make it happen. But I am making it sort of yours. my own production, uh -huh. and it feels kind of wonderful. And if it weren't for the financial aspects, as well as having a collaborator that you would actually like to work with, uh -huh. um, I wish we could do it alone. The problem has really become, as, as you know, that people that want to be producers um, feel uh, that they are entitled to be producers if they help finance mm -hmm. the play or the musical. In years past, those people were just investors. Now the investors want to be producers, and there's nothing wrong with it except when it comes to decision making, and I'm sure you'll <laughs> agree with me, <laughs> sitting around a table making a decision with you know 15 or 16 people is not really productive. And it often, you know, you want to have everybody feel like they're part of it, and you want them to be heard, and you want them to feel valued and respected. And all of that, you know, I try really hard to do. But sometimes it's just not an effective way to produce. Do you have to lay down the law and say, okay, the buck stops here? Yes, I'll take in your input, but uh -huh. we're going to make the decisions. The two of you are going to make the That's decisions. That's exactly what you do but you try and do it without them thinking that you're doing that. <laughs> well, you try to do it gracefully. <laughs> Sometimes there are uh, smaller producer meetings where you can actually make some decisions that then you can bring to the larger group and make sure everybody's on board with it. Uh -huh. you know. That's usually the way to do <laughs> That's it. That's a better way. You can't take uh, opinions of 16 people because they won't all agree. And you'll never get so, anything done. So you really well, have to it. make the decision and present it to them. And if two or three are not in accord with it, you persuade them to come into it. Sounds like jury but, duty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's fun. It, I mean, I'm sure you had a great time being the only producer on that play, but it's not uh, financially feasible to do it on Broadway. No, this is off-Broadway. You can manage yeah, it on right, your own. Exactly. Totally. Off-Broadway, you can have one or two people, but yeah. on Broadway, you have to have other people because the economics just won't allow it the other way. But I'd love to have just me. I <laughs> suppose the, the, the major decision comes with Kinky Boots, for example, when you say, okay, Harvey Firestein's going to write the book, Cindy Lauper's going to write the music, and did you say Jerry, Jerry Mitchell, Mitchell will do the choreograph and, and direct? How do you make those decisions? Um, well, in the case of Kinky Boots, um, I'm not as experienced in big Broadway musicals as I am mm -hmm. as comfortable doing plays. So I called a friend, Hal Luftig, who has done more musicals, and I said, Hal, I have optioned this project. I'm so jazzed about it and so excited. Would this interest you? I kind of feel it might. And so I started off by inviting him to be my partner right off the bat. And then in terms of the, the decisions going forward, we did them together. I always had Harvey in my mind. The minute I saw the movie, I said, this is for Harvey. Mm -hmm. And the music was a different 
coming to Cindy was a different path. We actually did something uh, I thought kind of interesting. We asked people to submit a couple of songs based on the movie and how they might see the score coming together. And we did a little process, which was enlightening. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we didn't really, we didn't come up with what we thought was the right, exact right combination. And so then we started brainstorming again. And um, it was actually Harvey who threw out Cindy's name when we were just talking together. And it was kind of a light bulb moment. Wow, could she write a musical? We love her music. I mean, True Colors is a song that sort of is an anthem in a way that I saw music coming together in Kinky Boots too. And we just reached out to her and she had said that she was always interested in thinking about writing a Broadway musical and the right material hadn't come her way. It just seemed kind of right. Uh -huh. I mean, we're taking a chance. Right. But the songs she has written so far are amazing, amazing. I mean, I'm so excited about this, I have to say. Nervous, because, you know, a big <laughs> musical is a big musical. <laughs> Jean, when you make decisions with Sonia, a, a, co a collaborator, um, do you bat ideas around uh, in terms of who you wanted, say, to direct The Mountaintop? Uh, did Kenny Leon Kenny is, yeah. direct it in London? No, no. No, you brought him in. James, uh, James Draper uh, directed in London because he was the director at uh, Theater 503. So when we moved it to the West End, he remained the, the uh, director. And why didn't you bring him in? Why, why did you bring... Uh, well, because uh, it was Broadway. Uh -huh. uh, and James was 23 years old. Uh -huh. And uh, if we were going to have somebody like Samuel Jackson and Angela Bassett, uh, it's a little difficult. Uh, and he's a wonderful director. Uh -huh. But Kenny Leon had done Fences. Uh -huh. and, uh, brilliantly. He, he, brilliantly. <laughs> and so we approached him. He loved the property. And uh, he was on board immediately. And so, so much of it has to do with availability. A exactly. lot of times people say, why did they pick him? Mm -hmm. Or why did they pick her? Well, you didn't see the five or six choices before you got to. We, you know, it's interesting you're talking about choices because David Cromer did Our Town. And then he did Broadway. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to come back to Off-Broadway, which I think is commendable because he selects things not only because they're Broadway, but because of the play itself. So he read Tribes and loved it and was willing to do it Off-Broadway. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, you know, people do select things not because of the, um, uh, let's say, <laughs> the Broadway aspect of it, but because they like the play. You mean the more commercial aspect? Can exactly. I make money on this? Exactly. Uh, as well, opposed I, I to... Well, we, may make, we, we may make money oh, on this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we did Mistakes sure. Were Made uh -huh. Off-Broadway with uh -huh. Michael Shannon, and, and that was not lucrative, but we did, you know, um, make our money back and then some. Uh -huh. Daryl, I would just add to that concept. I agree with, with you know, David being, you know, brave and courageous to do yeah. both Broadway and Off-Broadway, and many directors do. But I think the smartest director, and I will say the smartest producer, can know when the play in question belongs Off-Broadway in an yes. intimate setting uh -huh. or doesn't. Because I think the worst thing you can do to a play and, and therefore dishonor the playwright is to put something that really is meant to be seen in an intimate setting and meant to be experienced by audiences in one way and just put it on Broadway because we can and that's been done. And that's a bad yeah. thing to do that's for everybody. Been, right. Yeah. And that's been done. Yeah. So it's not only the choice, it's been done many times. Yes. And you wonder, you scratch your head and you and say, say, why? Why? Yeah. Why? You know, but just it, nurture the play in the way it should be nurtured. You know, it, it's, easy, it's easy for us to say that, you know, about somebody who decides to do it. But people are so passionate about the work that they do. It, I mean, if you do something off-Broadway and you're in love with it and you think everybody should see it, you say, well, let's bring it to Broadway. I mean, we may Well, be some the, people think that. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, some uh, people do. And uh, some people discredit Off-Broadway. That's the other problem. People don't think that if it's, you know, if it's not on Broadway, it's not worthy. That is just so... Yes. Wrong. Well, the, wrong. And there's so many you things know. about branding and, as you say, getting it to as large a number of people right. as possible. When you pick on... When you pick a, cho choose a project like Kinky Boots, there is the thing called workshop hell mm -hmm. or, or readings. <laughs> what they yes. going through? You you hear about shows that go through so many readings and mm -hmm. so many workshops. How do you, as producers, sort of decide a? How do I best use this time and best support the artist? 
and when do I know either it's finished, we're not going to proceed, or it's mm -hmm. time now to get it to Broadway? How do you make those choices in a workshop situation? Well, it's a very hard decision to stop a train once it's running. And I think that the workshop process gives you the chance to develop the material so it helps the writer and the composer lyricist and it also helps you try a little casting because I've been in workshop situations where we've tried an actor that we think might be right for the part and that may not have proved to be the case so the workshop was valuable mm -hmm. for that reason mm -hmm. and I think the development of a musical just does take time well you have I to mean, be prepared I think that uh, I wasn't involved in the workshop but uh, the Book of Mormon went through a couple of workshops <laughs> before it was perfected many. enough to many workshops before. And also, you know, somebody may really work very diligently and do a couple of workshops and present it to other producers to see if they can get investors and such. Mm -hmm. And the producers will not be turned down by it, so they won't be able to raise the money. So they go back to the blackboard and try another workshop. I mean, how many times has that happened? I mean, it's... Well, I think the problem with musicals is that you should, I think, go into the project with at least one or two partners at the core because you know you're going to have to expand that pool of investors slash co-producers. But if you don't have a committed tight group at the, you know, at the center of the project, it will be very hard to keep developing it. And you may give up on a musical that really yeah, shouldn't should. be given That's up true. to, uh -huh. you uh -huh. know. And if it's all about the money and you do these presentations as, as <laughs> Jean's is you know, suggesting, and you invite people and they don't get as excited about it as you are, <laughs> you think, okay, I'll just slit my throat and that will be the end of that. But you know, a fabulous musical could be thrown away in the, for the wrong reasons. For the That's, wrong reasons. That must be the nightmare. That must it, be your worst I'm sure it, I mean, nightmare. I, I'm not experienced that yet, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure it's a nightmare because you put so mm -hmm. much, a musical to me is the hardest thing ever to mount because there's so many, especially if you, if you don't do it, I mean, um, let's see, what, what musicals have been done from films? Nine to Five? Sure. Uh, Legally Blonde? Catch mm -hmm. Me If You Can. Catch mm -hmm. Me If You Can. Uh, just because hairspray. it's a... Hairspray? Hairspray. Mm -hmm. I mean, some succeed and some don't. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a it's not home run. not written in the Bible. No, it's not a home run. a movie run. is going to make a good musical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to say that. <laughs> Kinky Boots will be terrific. Kinky yeah. Boots, I can't <laughs> wait to see. You know, I live in hope. <laughs> you have to if you're I'm a an producer. I'm optimistic producer. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I'll tell you another thing. If you take a play and make it into a film, it's not 100% either. No. no. You're still taking a chance. Everything's a risk. I mean, I, I'm making a movie f about August, but I'm also making a film of the play uh, Blackbird. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw mm -hmm. it. I did see but, it. But uh, it's been two years in the making. Sure. David Harrow is writing the script. Uh, I was lucky enough to get uh, uh, Guillaume Canet to direct it, uh -huh. and now we're trying to cast it and all, but you just never know. Daryl, getting back to your point about stopping a train once you get going down, have you stopped a train? I did once, yes. Which one? Oh, such a sad chapter in my life. <laughs> it is, because that was but one I'll of the best things it. ever, Daryl. I mean, I really well, a tough one. champion you for doing that. Thank you. For I really do. That. It was Mambo Kings. Oh, yeah. And it was a project that I was really devoted to and thought had every possibility of being a wonderful musical, Latin music, beautiful story, romance. Everything about it was right. And it just didn't work. And we got it as far as the out of town. San Francisco. In San Francisco. And it just wasn't coming together. Uh, you know, we called in what we call, uh, script doctors and mm -hmm. we called in, you know, friends of the court. We just tried to figure it out in every which way, and it, it just broke my heart. But it wasn't meant to come to Broadway, and it wasn't... I mean, it was a very expensive proposition, mm -hmm. and it was really very sad and, as I said, disappointing. Because, first of all, I'm a person who is good to her word. And if I say I'm going to produce something, yes, yes. and I give my word, I am going to do it come hell or high water. And so that aspect of it was really personally devastating for me. And you feel so, you know, like you've let everybody down, you've disappointed everyone, which of course you have, and it's hard to live with. <laughs> well, um, I, but it I, was the I, right thing. In, yeah. in retrospect, it was truly the right thing. I have to interject and just mm -hmm. say that she championed this project, and uh, I thought it was wonderful that you did that. Well, I mean, really. That. Uh, she was terrific with it, and uh, it just wasn't meant to be. No. It so, so you think it was a second chance? No. 
No? No. So that's um, not one that's not for me. likely to have a second I mean, chance. if someone else wants to give it a try, it's still a great story. Well, if I gave it a try, would you come? <laughs> no, no. No, I would have to really um, say that th I had to close that chapter for me mm -hmm. because it was really very debilitating. I almost couldn't go on to yeah. keep producing. It was uh -huh. so awful that I wouldn't, I wouldn't reopen that, no. I mean, I'll take a chance on anything, but I'll take a new chance. You know what I mean? I, I won't go back and think, did I do something wrong and could I do it differently? Um, you know, I sort of beat myself up enough on that one, and it's over. It's over. You are Queen Esther. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Queen called, Esther. it's called Been There, Done That. Yes. Yeah, no. Part of the problem next. was that you had a neophyte director uh, who right. was connected to the project. I mean, that was part of the problem. Yeah. He was a talented uh, person, and uh, he had directed the film, and so, mm -hmm. you know, it was the right thing to do at the time. Um, but it ran its course. And you I have to say, it's, you know, it was for the best yeah. because what would have happened if I did just continue coming into New York, it would have not been successful. In my in my heart, I know it wasn't good enough mm -hmm. to be successful, and that probably would have been worse. I think to be a good producer, you have to know when to cut to your losses, when, <laughs> yes. when exactly. and how to cut yes. your losses. We've all a lot been there. Yeah. And painful as it is to close a show, believe me, it's it's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do, but you do it because uh, in respect to your investors, so you don't just keep. Mm -hmm you know, running the well dry. Mm -hmm. You have to just say, that's it. Sorry, it didn't work. We all hoped it would, but it didn't. Yeah, and it does happen. You had a fascinating experience, Jean, with The Mother with a Hat, uh, also known by I a longer title. I love that play. I just love that play. Mother with a Hat was fascinating because it wasn't working really in, in previews. Yes, it wasn't. I'll tell you why. Uh, Anna Shapiro directed it. And uh -huh. She, she was the director of August Osage County. Oh, sure. And I went to the previews at the beginning and uh, I'll tell you why people thought it wasn't working. It's because Chris Rock had never been on the, on the stage before. He's a performer and he's a wonderful comedian, but he'd never done theater. So people in previews were not giving him a chance. They were thinking that the play wasn't working because Chris was really kind of, you know, he was static. He, mm -hmm. he just, but I said, he will come to the fore because he's a performer. He wouldn't have taken this on if he didn't think in the long run he could do it. And with Bobby Cannavale and the other cast members, they brought it together and it was wonderful. I mean, it, the writing was wonderful, obviously. Well, you have Tim to give it time. I mean, you have you to, give it time. to give it time. You and that's what previews They call for. it previews. Yeah. But what's fascinating <laughs> about that particular thing was obviously uh, Scott Rudin was your co-producer yes, right. on, on that, as he is on Book of Mormon, and he's one of the smartest people in the business, I'm sure. Absolutely. We, on that, we all agree. Yeah. We all <laughs> there'll be no That's disagreement there. But there was a situation, what I've always found fascinating is that a producer once told me the only power that a producer has is the power to close the show. It's right. the only power they have. I don't agree with that. Okay. I don't you agree. You don't agree, with agree that. that's the only power they have? No. Well, yeah. they have a lot of powers, but that's the... I mean, the that's buck the stops ultimate, here. That's, that's the, the ultimate, ultimate power, power, but it's not the only power. No, no. That's I not mean, the, the only power, power of a producer well, is to make, to birth something. This is true, to get, but yeah, get right. getting that I train. mean, the beauty of right. the producer and the power of the producer is to make something happen. You are a facilitator of greatness if you are lucky. That's you very well said. Yes. <laughs> I, that's what I think a producer is. So but you're speaking to two facilitators <laughs> of greatness. Yes, <laughs> right? I like to feel that. <laughs> But once you've got your creative team going, yeah. and, a, and a writer wants to the show to be three hours, and you want it to be oh, two well, you hours, are definitely the, or two the, and a half hours, uh, the it buck depends stops on the writer. Here. But it does depend on the writer. You can't say to Edward Albee, you know, Edward, I think this is 45 minutes too long. Really? Bye-bye, producer. Exactly. That's I mean, true. That and, you know, but the only thing you can tell Edward is to say, then I'm going to close the show. But you don't do that. Well, that usually all happens day. before you get to that yeah, point. Yeah. Before well, you get one, to one of the fascinating things about obviously Mother with a Hat is that I know that there was a scene in the show, an which, which Scott thought the was writer. extraneous. Uh, there was an intermission, uh, which uh, there was the, the right, idea that somehow this wasn't working, and Scott came. Yes, but was but pretty you, firm. Yes, but you have to remember that the writer was the first time Broadway, mm -hmm. it was the first time on Broadway. So you do have some power then because if somebody is getting a chance to have their play on Broadway, and if Scott Rudin, who is a powerhouse on all fronts, says to you, now, you're either going to get your play on Broadway, 
the way I say I think it's going to succeed, because I've done a zillion plays, and this is your first play on Broadway, I think we should close it if you don't agree. And of course, the writer, being a wonderful writer, Stephen Gerges is a wonderful writer, and he's a wonderful human being, and he probably respected Scott's opinion because of Scott's track record. So Stephen probably says, if you think so, you Scott, think right. we'll do it. I and produced his play off Broadway. I know. Our, Our Lady, Lady of 121st uh, Street. Street. He's wonderful. He's yeah. a wonderful writer. He's a wonderful writer and, and, a, and a lovely human being. And he actually, I think, um, would say today that Scott was right. Yeah, of course. It's, it's a great story. And Scott story. was right. And he was. Way. I mean, but, yeah, he's a wonderful writer. I've, I've championed his work. Yeah. I wasn't involved in, in that play, but I had worked with him off Broadway. He's from the Lambrin Theater. Mm -hmm. It's with, a great uh, example of, of yeah. how a smart producer can steer change the entire mm -hmm. story. Well, I mean, Scott's the smartest. Absolutely change the entire story. Mm -hmm. You've done some remarkable work in terms of taking real chances on shows like the normal the revival of the normal heart and Carolina Change. Mm -hmm. Shows that are not commercial. Mm -hmm. Would it, wit seemingly, <laughs> but wit <laughs> that was the that was the least commercial. <laughs> of all. Seemingly. Seemingly. Not. Not yeah, commercial. Not a happy ending. Would you produce a play that you felt, I don't care if it makes a dime, I'm going to produce it because I just believe in it. I, and I think this was the thinking behind Carolina Change. I don't think anybody yeah. expected to ever make their money back. May I just if, interrupt? Yes, please. I think that if you're a producer that really wants to do good work, that's your feeling every time you read something you think is great. You say, I'm going to produce this because I think it's great no matter what and you try and convince your co-producers that you're right. But, but don't you feel that way? I mean, well, I think that, y yes, I do feel that way. And I think in my case, I've always felt that, um, and I've said this before, that theater deals in a different currency. It's not about the money all the time. And I don't mean to sound disrespectful or, or um, not appreciative of investors' money. I never want to take an investor along on a journey that I think is going to end up you know, in a horrible place. Well, but it's because I believe in something strongly. And while it may not say commercial, commercial all over it, if the story is there and if, if you put together a really first class quality production, um, you can be quite surprised that it will become commercial. In the case mm -hmm. of Wit, in the case of um, oh, How I Learned to Drive a long time ago is another example of a play that no one thought should have a commercial transfer. Um, certainly The Normal Heart was done um, with such deep love and, and, and respect for the work and the importance of the work. And, I mean, there are, there are so many reasons I could tell you why I needed to do that play. Mm -hmm. And certainly making money was not really on the list. <laughs> what was money? on the list was giving money because we had philanthropic partners and I felt that it was a, an opportunity to give back rather than worry about making money. Did you and make money did. On, the, on the normal heart? Um, we gave back about 65% of the capitalization from New York, but we're planning a tour of the normal heart and a production in London. And I, I, hope, I hope that I'm able to recoup everybody's money. And I think that everyone that was involved in the normal heart felt that they wouldn't have done it any other way. And that in this case, we had so many rewards that may not have been financial, but were so much more significant. It just wasn't even, you know. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm financially very responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I'm financially <laughs> very responsible. But sometimes something comes into your life, and you just must do it. And you must do it. And Carolina Change was another example. Carolina That's Change easy. was another example, but a different example than the normal heart, because it was a community of people that came together. Mm -hmm. Everyone, first of all, we love George C. Wolfe, and he's the connector on, because he directed right. both Caroline right. and The Normal Heart, uh, among other magnificent productions. But all of us that wanted to see Caroline have another life joined together, and we all said, if we all just put in X number of dollars, we can make this happen. So it was a community effort uh, in a different way. Uh, the Normal Heart was my, you know, just crazy, unbridled passion. I had to do it. Jean, if you were really, really... Um, taken with a project and in an off-Broadway situation, uh, the New York Times panned it. Would you still bring it to Broadway? Well, I'd have to be more responsible than that. Uh -huh. You know, I may not take it to Broadway, but uh, I would uh, possibly try and tour it if I really believed in it, uh -huh. you know, into regional theaters. Or, but I, I'd have to give it much thought 
uh, because I'd have to be responsible to my investors and uh, I wouldn't want to risk their money unless, I mean, uh, there have been plays that have not been very well received uh, critically that have made it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more and so, more so. Actually. Well, more and more so. Word of mouth, word of yeah. mouth, word of mouth is the most important thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think word of mouth, and uh, now with, uh, you know, you don't have to really depend on the paper press mm -hmm. because there's so many bloggers with opinions, and there's so much you can do virally to offset. I hope the press isn't listening. <laughs> 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 to it's okay. To I'm here. I'm here. But representing. That, that's quite all right. <laughs> but am I right about that? I mean, sure. I mean, yes. I mean, it's a whole new ball game in many respects. But what it does do, and this is now preview hell, where yeah. at intermission of the first preview, people are blogging about how horrible. Exactly. The show is. Exactly. So you really that really bothers me. Well, to talk about it because there are replete examples of, say, you know, Passion or Spider-Man or any of these shows, mm -hmm. Titanic, who just went through hell and high right. water. As a producer, how do you keep your company's morale up under a situation when you are just getting blasted in the press? You have to be really a cheerleader and uh, you have to buoy them up. You are the head. You gotta say, don't pay attention to that. I don't, don't think don't pay attention. Let's pay attention to it and let's find out how we're going to fight it. We're mm -hmm. a team here. So let's think of the different ways we can combat this. Mm -hmm. And that makes them really come, it's like, it's like a sport, isn't it? For me, the most important thing to do if you open a play and it doesn't get well reviewed is to immediately go to the theater and be with the cast and the company and be you know, nurturing and supportive. And I literally bring chicken soup or cookies. <laughs> and I sit everybody down and I say, look, I did this because I believe in it. We're going to give it our best chance. I'm going to try to keep this going as long as people will come. If people are liking it and the word travels, we might be able to make this happen. And I just want you to know I'm not giving up on you and I'm not putting up notice for Sunday night. Oh, yeah. that, that I, I always to do. say that to people. That uh -huh. you have to do. Because they always, the minute the reviews come out, everybody gets quiet. Well, they all think they're yeah. going to be out they're of a job on Sunday. They think they're going to be out uh -huh. of a job. And so you really have to do that. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and you know, nurture them, but meanwhile have your team ready to come back. Yeah, I mean, and then you can go out and cry your eyes out, which <laughs> I've done, and say, oh my God, what am I going to do now? I've got to make this work. And, and you just try. You know, mm -hmm. you try the hardest and you try everything you can to make it work. But the first and most important thing is that we're dealing with people. Mm -hmm. And very emotional people. <laughs> um, and I don't just mean on stage. I mean, I'm like the biggest mush pot in the world. But you have to keep everybody feeling like you care about them, that their work is respected, you value their contribution to this production. And it is very challenging when somebody is out there saying that their work is not valuable. And to me, the most important thing is, is just to, you know, to keep everybody feeling like we're doing something good. Going back a couple of steps before it opens, and yep. you're still in that development process, you're still sort of... Mm -hmm. maybe early previews. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, it's a, such a delicate chemical reaction to the theater, and you sometimes have people, the book writer, not agreeing with the composer, or mm -hmm. you, there, there may be dissension in the ranks. How do you deal with that? <laughs> Daryl? <laughs> yeah. That's tricky, you know, because you hope that a lot of that dissension might just be nerves might just be we're coming to the finish line now and we're all so scared and have we done work that's good and, and will it work? Will it work? I think a lot of it is just people being anxious and nervous and on edge and short-tempered, you know, and because you've come this journey together and one would assume if you've gotten to this point that there is a camaraderie, there is a mutual respect, there is a working relationship that on some level is working. Mm -hmm. But there are But egos. it often happens. There are egos. There are no. huge egos. There are egos, and so huge. if uh, you know if the director wants to cut a line and the writer loves its babies, yeah, and uh, that is true. Uh, it's hard. You know, the writer doesn't want to cut uh, their darlings out, yeah. And the director said, "Well, you know, uh, it's not going to work that way because it is not funny or it's too long." Or, well, you really have to be a, a diplomat, mm -hmm. a, a, an incredible diplomat. You can't side with one or the other. Mm -hmm. I found something else. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but. Uh, there's a play that I'm in, a musical that I'm involved in called It Should Have Been You, huh. which is just finishing up at George Street Playhouse and hopefully will come in to the city. Now, 
I bring this up as an example because it's a first-time director and a first-time uh, playwright. However, the first-time director is David Hyde Pierce, uh -huh. <laughs> who has been in so many wonderful, wonderful plays and musicals. And the writer is a very experienced and well-respected television writer. So they're not newbies. And the relationship, and then there is a composer involved in this too. And the relationship and the working together to make this project, it should have been you as good as it gets. And by the way, Tyne Daly is in it, so yeah. you, you have a lot of, you know, egos. But yet, the egos, in my view, having seen this, have just been put aside. And everybody cares so much about this work. I've never seen such a smooth, cooperative, we, we just need to make this, lines are being cut, scenes are changing. You know, this was in the uh -huh. leading up to the previews. Uh -huh. Just to make it as good as it could. And, and we're talking about people that have every right yes, to, to, be, to hold their ground. But also, if they're new, they're scared. And they, they want to make it right. They, make, they, they want to make it right investment. because it's their opportunity. Yeah, well, if that's it, true. And it's I their think opportunity. I mean, David Hyde Pierce is wonderful. And he's a really good director, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it's his first time directing. That's right. And, that's you have right. A, and you have somebody, so they're really neophytes. So they want to make it work. So on this first but venture, willing it'll be open. great. They're willing and open. You brought up a good point uh, in terms of David Hyde Pierce. And you worked with him on Curtains. Yes. So you produced Curtains. Yes, I did. You won the Tony for it. Yes. When you have a longstanding friendship or, uh, you know, relationship, relationship. Yeah. with someone, uh, how c ruthless can you be when that longstanding relationship and loyalty comes mm -hmm. against strong creative decisions that yeah. is necessary to protect the work? Well, here's the good side, the flip side of that. And this happens with Charles Bush and, and me and other mm -hmm. people that I've worked with, David. I think because you have that relationship, there's a different level of respect for your opinion. And knowing that there's some love there, you only want the best for the piece. It's not personal. And it's also compromise, I, isn't it? You compromise and it's compromise. A bit. I mean, you, you give up a little here and give them a little there. Say, well, if we do this, then maybe we can do that. I mean, you have yeah. to be... Really, I think yeah. you have to be. But I think they respect your judgment if they know you really care about them. I think that they you, if you have that relationship in some way, it's easier, not harder. You can argue with a person that you love in a different way than you can argue with a person that you feel, yeah. you know, you're out right. to get me. Uh -huh. There's a different level of There's communication. There's an understanding. There's, There's an, an understanding. understanding. And a loyalty. That's right. And a trust. And a trust. trust me. I right. think I know what's right here. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you've had to fire somebody? Have you had to make a, a ruthless decision like that? I have like not that? had to make that kind of decision. No, I have you? not had to make that decision. I think it, it would be a very hard decision for me to make. I have made decisions to not bring cast members along from one stage of development to another. Mm -hmm. For example, um, uh, we did a reading of a play, and I'm sure the whole cast thought that they were going to come along to the next, and, and at that point it was easier to know that it wasn't going to work, let's end it here, let's not carry mm. it further. But I've never had to fire someone who's been hired already. I think now with readings, I, mm -hmm. I, I have found that if you ask somebody to do a reading, they don't necessarily think or presuppose. Sometimes they do. Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they do. Or they hope. They, they, hope. they hope, <laughs> but they don't expect it. They, don't, they know you're not you know, uh, right. obligated right. or obliged to have them come forth, but they're hoping for they're it. Hoping. Yeah. But, uh, you know, usually between a reading and the time you actually get it on, it's such a long period of time that they usually have got another job. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel that badly about it if you don't select them. Yeah. It transfers in terms of transfers. Mm -hmm. you, you, you chose not to transfer wit in a season in which it might have won the, the Tony Award, as I recall. Not to transfer to Broadway. To Broadway. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Correct. That's r right. You, you kept it off Broadway. This goes back to the, the comment we made before. Uh -huh. I think wit could have done beautifully on Broadway. However, at that time when it was done, which was many years ago, I didn't think it was a Broadway play, you know, and nobody else did either. We weren't able really? to get a theater. I wanted it to be off-Broadway where I felt we could have more, more, more uh, people come and see it, both from an economic point of view, from the ticket prices, but also I wanted to have people come that were nurses and caregivers and people involved you know, in, in what this subject was, rather than have it be uh, out of reach. 
part of me wanted it to be off-Broadway. On the other hand, we had tried to get a small Broadway theater, but it wasn't available, and at that, or wasn't available to us. And at that point, I felt very comfortable with the decision to keep it off-Broadway. I really did. Yeah. I felt, and, and I think it was the right decision. It ran for many years, and, and um, after Kathleen Chalfant, who was magnificent as the first uh, professor bearing, uh, Judith Light came in, and I adore her. I adore uh -huh. this woman. <laughs> and, um, and, she's, and, and now it is going to be on Broadway with Cynthia Nixon. It is, is going correct? to be revived. Or I feel so old. I can't <laughs> tell you this. Tell Two of my it. plays are being revived this year. <laughs> revived? Wait a minute. I'm going to need to be revived. So <laughs> How I Learned to How Drive. How I Learned to Drive is uh, going to be done at Second Stage, and Wit is being done at Manhattan Theatre Club with Cynthia Nixon. Jean, you chose to transfer democracy from, it, from London to right. Broadway. Is that right? Well, actually, uh, Bob Boyette and Bill Hamer were the lead mm -hmm. producers on that. I came on board after, but I thought it was a wonderful play and I wanted to be part of it, so I was the co-producer on that. And did you fly to London to see it, and did you see it there and make yes. a decision on that basis? Yes, on that basis. A lot of plays, as you have experienced recently, yes. <laughs> don't necessarily make the trip across <laughs> the ocean. Enron was one, Enron sadly. Enron was one, Corum yes. Boy was, was Corum another. Boy was another. Yeah. I think you were both involved with both Enron and Corum Boy. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a hard thing to judge. No, I was not involved in Corum Boy. Oh, I, no, no, I was. Uh, Darryl was. Yeah. Um, in terms of democracy, I saw it in London. And I thought, thought it was a wonderful play. Absolutely. Wonderful. And Amazing. I thought it was wonderful here as well. What happened? I mean, what do you... Do? I think it was the, the reviews, really, and it couldn't survive without the reviews. It was that. It was, it was just that. lackluster. And, and uh, there were very good people in it, but there weren't any real superstars in it. And at that time, I think we were just making the transition that you had to have somebody of huge note, not just good actors and wonderful names, but uh, serious uh, box office people. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, I can't do this anymore? Either of you? No. Not <laughs> Never. Me. I, I, not yeah, at this I, moment. Mm, mm, I have felt it from Have time. you felt it? Yeah. And what got you through? I guess a good night's sleep. <laughs> 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 I know somebody telling me that I'm doing a good job. You know. You get depressed well, sometimes. Well, you, you know, you do, but uh, the minute you read something that ignites your interest, you think, yeah. oh, why would I think of stopping? This is so good, and I can see such and such doing it, and he can direct it, and let's do it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's well, a momentary we, laugh. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm involved in all three mediums. I'm doing television mm -hmm. now, too, and film, and it's hard work, but I can't think of what else would, I, what else would you do? Don't uh. you? <laughs> Patrick would Wash write a windows. play, which yeah. he is. I wrote a play. There <laughs> you go. That's oh, what he would do. And boy, is it scary, let yes. me tell you. That's a lonely profession. It's scary. Writing it's is a lonely profession. Is it scary to be a creative Broadway producer? Is it no, it's not scary. It's not scary. It's not scary. I mean, and I, I kid a bit when I say, you know, have I wanted to end this? I, I would never end this career. I just get sometimes in need of encouragement. Um, Especially no, if you it's read, not scary. You it's thrilling. <laughs> it's thrilling. <laughs> if you read a review, <laughs> it's not scary. Yeah, you want to shoot yourself. <laughs> you want to sh <laughs> but, uh, but then, you know, you pick up no. your... It's very fulfilling. I mean, speaking for myself, I find the most fulfilling thing is being able to, uh, to work with creative people and to, you know, help make something happen from nothing. I mean, you can make something happen from nothing that will remain in the cultural yeah. landscape forever. I mean, well, that's huge. That's your hope. I mean, we all hope that. But, uh, I mean, of the three mediums, that's almost the most satisfying because you get immediate oh, gratification. Sure. And with live people. And with live people. And you hear this uh -huh. every night. <laughs> you, know. you know what they're going to do with uh, plays now, at least we've been approached, to film. I mean, they filmed uh, Memphis, mm -hmm. and uh, they're asking us to film mountaintop, which I think would be wonderful to have people in Iowa, uh -huh. in Michigan, and all of those outer boundaries that perhaps don't get to see theater. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to try and accomplish. What uh, would you advise a young person coming into the business who wants to be a producer and says, Ms. Roth, Ms. Humanian, how did you get there from here? <laughs> I say, come and be my intern. <laughs> and you'll learn a lot, which they have. A lot of people come to New York and they don't know what, they want to be producers or they want to be writers. And I think the best thing to do is to work 
in a producer's office and learn what is the background of making things happen. And what qualities would you look for in that person to invite them into your office? Obviously, well, these uh, I mean, a person is uh, recommended to you and they come in and you have to ask them the right questions and what mm -hmm. their, what what their goals ask? are. What do I ask? Mm -hmm. I say to them, why do you want to work here? A and what are your goals? And what is your background? And uh, if they give me all the right answers, I, I send them to a desk. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's the beginning step, to come in and intern in a producer's office. That's good. But if a person is a little more experienced, I mean, I've had, uh, <laughs> I've had middle-aged interns. You know, there are a lot of women that want to get back into something. Oh, interesting. Uh, they've raised their families. They're not just right out of college and say, I want a career in theater. But there are people, in fact, as I started uh -huh. later in my life, sure. um, that want to come in and want to understand how does this work. And they're already at a different place in life and have relationships with people and, and can actually raise some money. So my advice is if you want to get in on a production and learn, perhaps it's easier to, to say, I, I'd like to try to be an associate producer on this play with you. I want to work with you. I want you to show me how to do this. But I want to go out and try to raise some money. Because really, if you can't do that as a producer, then that's really not the right job for you. You can do something else in theater. You can do some wonderful work. But it, really, producing has to do with putting it together and getting <laughs> it done. Let's so just get to the bottom line. That's a very good note. Yeah. But even if you can do all that, if you can't pick the right property, right? You know, some producers pick the right property and get other people to raise the money. Well, on that note, putting it together, putting we'll have to together. stop this uh, conversation. This fascinating conversation. Uh, you guys put it together, and you, as Sondheim also wrote, our favorite, um, <laughs> our favorite. <laughs> yes. uh, you make a hat where there never was a hat, and they're pretty oh, damn good ones. That's very sweet. Thank <laughs> anyway, you. Thank you thank very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you it's for having It's been fun. Us. Thank you. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of American Theatre Wing, I'm Patrick Pacheco, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.